One is I kind of out of commission the last couple of days, uh, not not feeling well. I still got uh, migraines bothering me today, which don't actually hurt, but they're messing up my senses. I can't really uh, see properly and things like that with with, with migraine RS. Um, I was kind of trying to decide uh, whether to cancel lab this afternoon or not. I don't think I'm contagious and affect, infecting anybody or anything like that. I just uh, don't know how well I can uh, handle the chaos. One thing that occurred to me is the thing I was dreading most about lab today, just kind of the uh, cacophony of a lot of conversations going on at once that's hard to deal with with, uh, with, with, with migraines. Um, again, um, to kind of maybe use the time in a slightly quieter way, I hate to give up today's lab because it's fun, but uh, could, could we do reviews instead of lab this afternoon? Yes. yes. Okay, that would be a little bit easier <laughs> for me to handle just because it's not as many conversations uh, going on at once, which is exactly what I can't do when I've got the, uh, the, the sensory orizol kind of thing going. So the, um, that would work well for me. Um, again, the lab that we have planned today is a uh, fun one, but it's a fun one in the sense that uh, it's, Chaos. It's chaotic and it's more amusing than something that you uh, absolutely have to do. It's, it's, it's a puzzle lab, which is why I don't want to give it up. It's a, uh, a series of mystery boxes that you have to figure out what's inside them. And it's a uh, diode in series with the capacitor with the resistor jumping across it or something like that. It's a, um, it, it's a fun lab, but um, the like I said, I think I would uh, probably probably get through the day better if we, um, if we do something a little bit quieter than that. So, um, Also, announcement. Yeah. All right. Speech, speech. Well, <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but uh, if it weren't for Paul Graham, I probably wouldn't be in Physics 4B this semester. And so, Paul, you can look at this as like a Christmas gift. But for me and for a lot of the people in this room right now, this is pretty much just a general thank you for offering this section of the class and taking all your knowledge and giving it to us. So we have been designing this shirt. Holy shit. And we would like to give it to you. Oh, you guys are so awesome. Thank you. <laughs> says this on the front. <laughs> <laughs> and it says this on the back. <laughs> Destroy nuclear force be with you? Yes. I think that's directly quoted from one of your problem sets. Yeah. <laughs> so that's yours. Thank you guys. Yeah. That was so nice of you. <laughs> this is just tricky. Perfect. I'll wear this to my Physics 10 finals next week also. The, uh, the Physics 10 students will uh, will appreciate that. Yeah. Some of them were telling me they don't understand why I hate Ben Franklin that much. I can reassure them that I actually don't. But. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that is great. Thank you guys. Yeah. All right. Um, so we were finishing up on vector calc identities in general, and we were finishing up on Maxwell's equations. So the idea here is, again, you know, hopefully we just managed to give you a pretty good uh, sense of what's meant by, uh, so now I know why you were asking me about uh, shirt sizes. <laughs> so we, we uh, no, we have a better sense now of what was meant by Divergence and curl, hopefully. And again, you could sum up everything that we have done in this class, actually, with those four equations. Coulomb's law and everything that came out of Coulomb's law, Gauss's law, the whole technique of superposition integrals and all that, flows straight from that first one. Divergence of the E field depends on charge density. If we ever start to discover magnetic monopoles in nature, and if we can add uh, superposition integrals of magnetic monopole charge density and all that kind of thing, um, we'll modify this second equation. But for now, the non-existence of magnetic monopoles is that second equation. 
third one, uh, well, let's skip to the fourth one, because the fourth one contains everything about static B fields in it, the fact that a moving charged particle or any region of current density creates a pattern of B fields, and again, that wrap around it by the curl theorem, um, comes out of that equation. And then finally, these last two that have the time-dependent terms in them, that's Faraday's law, and that's Maxwell's kind of flipped version of Faraday's law. Faraday had discovered that a changing magnetic field creates electric fields, and what do the electric fields do? They wrap around the axis of the rate of change of B. So Faraday's law is right in there. And then Maxwell had said, hey, it also works the other way around. Changing electric fields create magnetic fields. So that's like I said, both a good just exercise in how to use vector calculus in general, and I hope also a um, kind of great way to, to, to sum up everything that you've uh, learned this semester about electromagnetism. Now there are a couple of um, mathematical identities that I wanted to uh, show to you and kind of at least describe the geometric interpretation of them that, uh, that are useful not just for Maxwell's equations in physics, but these are identities that are true for vector calculus in general. One of them is if I give you any vector field, any function that lays out a set of vectors all through space, if you were to take the, not take, let me do this one first, if I give you any scalar field, if you were to take the gradient of that scalar field, so let's let B be just some random scalar. I take the gradient of phi, which means I take the, uh, I calculate a vector that points in the direction of most rapid increase in phi. And if you think about just kind of geometrically what's going on here, so if I take the gradient of phi, first off, phi started out as a scalar. If I take its gradient, have I now got a scalar or have I got a vector? I've got a vector. And since I've got a different vector at every point in space, I've got a vector field. So if I've got a vector, I could do two things with it. I could take the divergence, and the divergence of the gradient is actually kind of a, um, a product rule. I might as well write that. I were to take the uh, divergence of the gradient. Well, no, I won't. I won't spam with too many right now. I'll do just the ones I need. If I were to take the curl of the gradient, I'll stick with that. So I've got this gradient field that points in the direction where my original scalar increases the most rapidly. <laughs> And now I calculate a curl, which means I calculate how that gradient wraps around in a circle. By all rights, what ought I to get? A vector. I, I, I should get a vector. The curl of a vector field is another vector field. But if I'm taking the curl of the gradient, now remember, curl means how does the vector field I'm looking at wrap around. So how does the gradient wrap around in a circle? What's that? Ah, good question, does it? If it did, I would be looking at what kind of universe? Universe is imagined by M.C. Escher. If I've got a gradient which is telling me which direction something is increasing the most rapidly, so if these blue vectors are supposed to be the gradient of my original vector field, and if those vector, if that gradient wraps around in a circle like that, then I would be saying, yeah, that vector field phi is increasing if I go this direction, and it's continuing to increase, and it's continuing to increase. And wait a minute, I'm back where I started. If phi was a well-defined function, it couldn't have been increasing that whole time. It's kind of the fundamental theorem of gradients that says if I take the line integral of the gradient of some function, dl, I'm supposed to get my original scalar function back at the ending point minus that same original scalar function at the starting point. Well, if I take a closed curve, if the starting and ending point are the same, I should get zero here. But wait a minute, the integral of the curl of any vector field around a, or the integral of any vector field around a closed curve gives me kind of the integral through the interior of the curl of that vector field. The curl of the gradient has got to be zero. If it's not, then this phi is kind of describing an M.C. Escher universe where it can be continuing to increase and increase and increase and increase, and yet we're back to the same starting point. 
So the curl of the gradient of any scalar field is always going to be zero. That's a useful little identity there. There's another useful identity, which is that the divergence of the curl. So if I start with some vector field A, I take the curl of A, so now I've still got a vector field. And since A could have been any vector function, this time I'm not getting zero, I'm just getting whatever the curl of A is. But if I take then the divergence of that vector function that I just built, that's also going to have to be zero. The best way I can think about this is, again, to think about the fundamental theorem of curls. The best way to realize why this had to be true is think how the fundamental theorem of gradients works and say, wait a minute, if I integrate the gradients around a closed curve, there's no way I can end up getting anything but zero. If I think about how the um, fundamental theorem for curls work, if I were to... integrate the curl of A over any bounded surface. If I'm doing a surface integral, I'll take that vector, the curl. Oh, once again, same thing I realized last time I was showing the curl theorem is I should not name that vector field A because I want to have A available for the area element because I'm integrating the curl of A through some bounded surface. What's that going to give me? That's going to give me, I, I differentiated my vector field B, then I integrated it. That better give me my same vector field B back. And I've got to evaluate it at the boundaries of my region. With my um, line integral, that was easy. Evaluating my original function at the boundaries of the region just meant endpoint minus starting point. Here, I say, well, I've got to evaluate my original function B at the boundaries of that bounded soap bubble surface that I was just building. Well, the boundary isn't just two points. It's every point around that soap bubble. So this is why on the right-hand side of the curl theorem, I've got to take a line integral of my original B function around the outside. Now, what does that give me? So you can say curl of B at any point. If I say, hey, right here. If curl of B is pointing out of the page, if it's pointing kind of normal to that soap bubble out of the page, that means B, the vector field, is wrapping around counterclockwise. If it's pointing into the page, B, the vector field, is wrapping around clockwise. If I kind of pull every point <coughs> on that soap bubble, and I ask, hey, at this point right here, does the vector field seem to be wrapping around counterclockwise or clockwise? How about at this point? How about at this point? If I take an equal pull of all those points, hire Nate Silver or somebody for that part, and I, um, I integrate that over the whole thing, what I'm going to get is, will the overall circulation of my B field around the outside be clockwise? If so, that means the curl must have been mostly into the page. Or will it be counterclockwise, in which case the curl was mostly out of the page? So again, that's just kind of what the fundamental theorem of curls means. And again, if you apply that to this fact, that's just leaving off that time-dependent term, what you end up with is just Ampere's law. You immediately find Ampere's law that says, oh yeah, if you take the line integral of your B field around that closed curve, what you get will get the integral of the curl through the inside. That's the fundamental theorem. But hey, the curl of B is just the uh, uh, current density. So you get the integral of the current density through that soap bubble. In other words, you get I enclosed. So Ampere's law is just kind of a way of restating that curl theorem. But what if I take this soap film and I curve it back around to a closed surface? So if I take the boundary of the soap film and I start to close it up, so I've still got that you know, boundary there, but my soap film is now kind of this three-dimensional hot air balloon shape with just a little boundary down there. I could still say, well, I integrate the curl of B through that soap film, and it'll tell me the circulation of B around that little boundary. But if I shrink the boundary down towards zero, I'm closing up the bottom aperture of that hot air balloon. 
the line integral of my B field around that boundary has got to be shrinking to zero because the boundary itself is shrinking to zero. I've got nowhere left to take the line integral. And if I close it up all the way, and I'm still integrating the curl over that whole boundary, what I'm now getting is the outward flux of the curl. Well, hey, the outward flux of any field, outward flux of any vector, this time I call this one C, over some area. Now this is the fundamental theorem of divergences. I will get that by integrating through the inside the volume enclosed by that surface, the divergence of C. Tell me, if this C vector was supposed to represent the curl of the B field, or, yeah, so I take the divergence of the curl. If it's supposed to represent the curl of the B field, on one hand, I just said that as I shrink that aperture down to zero, the integral of the curl over that whole thing has to vanish. On this, on the other hand, this is telling me, no, the integral of the curl over the uh, whole interior of that, or the whole surface, should just be equal to the integral over the inside of the divergence of the curl. So on one hand, the you know, the curl over that whole soap film has to vanish because I'm taking the boundary of the soap film and I'm shrinking it to zero. On the other hand, the curl, the integral of the curl over that whole thing should equal the integral over the interior of the divergence of the curl. How can both of those things be true? Only if it turns out that the divergence of the curl of any vector field is always zero. So you've got those two things where if you kind of think about how the fundamental theorems would start to contradict each other if these right-hand sides weren't zero, both of these theorems, which are really useful theorems in vector calc, because it means, hey, if I'm just kind of taking some vector calc operations and I find that my the algebra just spit out this expression, or this expression, then it doesn't matter what my original vector field is, I'm getting zero. No matter what my original vector field is, the divergence of the curl is zero. No matter what my original scalar field is, the curl of the gradient is zero. There's one other theorem which doesn't have quite as nice a geometric uh, interpretation, but that I also want to give you, which is what happens if I take the curl of the curl? of any vector field. Well, this time, sadly, I don't get zero. The curl of the curl is not zero. I was used to just trying, trying to say, how am I going to argue that it's zero this time? But this time, as it turns out, I can't. What I do end up getting is this. I get two different terms, and I always have to think, how do I construct them? One of them is going to be the Laplacian. This little operator here, del squared, is known as the Laplacian, after the mathematician Laplace who first investigated it. Yeah. Is it just like taking the second derivative in like three dimensions? It is like taking the second derivative in okay. three dimensions, exactly. What it actually represents is the dot product of the del operator with itself. If I take the del operator, which you remember, del just as an operator, not del of anything, has an x component which is ddx, a y component, which is ddy, and a z component, which is ddz. And if it seems like I've left out, well, ddx of what? Well, that's why it's an operator. I still haven't specified what it's, what it's acting on. Yeah. So then it's, if it's a dot product, then it's a scalar then. Yes, del squared by itself is a scalar. Now del squared of a vector, you'd say, oh, yeah, that's like taking scalar times a vector. This is going to be a vector. But del squared I can apply to a scalar or a vector. Because what yeah. del squared is, by definition, it just means I take del and I dot it with itself. So it's still an operator. Del squared is not a function yet. It's still an operator on functions. 
But what do I do if I take the dot product? I just multiply the x components. Well, we said before, if I talk about multiplying an operator by something, what I really mean is acting the operator on that thing. So if I take ddx of ddx, ddx times ddx, what that gives me is d squared dx squared. So that's the x component of del times the x component of del again. And then y component of del times the y component of del again gives me that second derivative. Z component gives me that second derivative. And the instructions that this operator is giving me is just take all those second derivatives and just add them together. So it's like a second derivative, a curvature operator, but it's a curvature operator in three dimensions instead of along one dimension. So what's this saying? It's saying, now just take that del squared operator and apply it separately to each of the three components of the B field. Take the second derivative of Bx, that'll be the x component of your answer. Take the sec three-dimensional second derivative of By, that'll be the y component of your answer, and so on. So that's one of the terms you get from this. The other one, I always just have to say, when I'm trying to remember the other one, how the hell am I going to construct a vector by taking another second derivative here? And I said, well, I started with b. The only ways to take to uh, get a vector out of b are to, uh, to take the curl of it. So I'd say, OK, I take the curl of b, because that will give me a vector. Oh, wait. No, I take the divergence of b, which will give me a scalar. And then now that this is a scalar, I can take the gradient of this, and that gives me back a vector, which is what I need over here. My original thing was going to spit out a vector. So that is this last second derivative operator. Not nearly as clean as the two that I told you over here. Curl of the gradient is zero because otherwise M.C. Escher rules the universe. Divergence of the curl is zero because otherwise I would get an infinite circulation around that little aperture that I've cut out of the hot air balloon there. Curl of the curl is just the Laplacian with a minus sign on it, plus this other term that I always have to construct by scratch every time I need it. But I just remember that there's two terms in this identity. Did we even prove these out algebraically? But the, um, the, the proof is not so interesting as what you can do with that one. Now, before I show you what you can do with that one, let me digress slightly to talk to you about something that you, uh, of course, re have right at the front of your mind because you remember it clearly from the end of 4a. Of course. This is the, uh, the, the wave equation. Now, when I, said the, when I asked Marcus to teach the wave equation, he said, oh, yeah. And then it turned out what he meant was he gave, showed you the solution to the wave equation. Did you see the actual differential equation in 4a that we call the wave equation? No, not in Joe's class. We were told that it started as one. OK. We, we saw the solution. I'm going to show it to you, and I'm going to show it to you kind of without deriving it. If this was the end of 4a, what I would want to do is take something like a string, and I would apply Newton's laws to a little, little segment of the string. And uh, well, if the string's curved, then the tensions pulling on those curved things actually pull that section of the string downward, so it'll accelerate downward. What I end up getting if I apply Newton's laws to a little stretch of a curved string is this. I get the acceleration of that point on the string. So d squared, let's say, we'll call this the y-axis, and we'll call this the x-axis. So d squared y dt squared depends on, well, it depends on some things that you'd expect. It depends on the tension in the string. It depends inversely on the mass density of the string. Be mass per unit length. We also use lambda for charge per unit length in our class, but um, you know, again, lambda is just kind of in the same way that rho could be mass per unit volume over charge per unit volume. This is the same way in this context, it's mass density. And it depends on the curvature of that string. So if I've got this downward curvature, if I think about the tension pulling on both ends, it doesn't quite line up. So it's going to end up pulling that string downward. A minus sign. And I get a d squared y, dx squared. OK, that's the wave equation in one dimension. 
What would this look like in three dimensions if I had a um, stretched membrane instead of a, uh, a, a stretched string? I would just end up saying, well, if it was a membrane, I'd have two spatial derivatives. I'd have um, d squared z dx squared, d squared z dy squared. If I had the wave equation in three dimensions, it just looks like this. d squared, well, hell, I'm just going to leave the one-dimensional version up there. And then what I'm going to tell you is, because the reason I suddenly said I don't want to draw the three-dimensional version, is if I'm doing it in three dimensions, I no longer have one axis free to be the variable I'm solving for. So now I have to tell you, well, what I'm solving for is pretty much like an E field or a B field or something. And we're going to see that in a moment anyway. So I'm just going to say, hey, here's your one dimensional version of the wave equation. What solution does that end up giving you? The solution that gives you is y can be any amplitude times cosine of kx minus omega t. Plug that into both sides. Just treat this as an ansatz that I just gave you. Plug it into both sides. I'll leave that as an exercise for the reader, but it, it, it works. You get the same thing on both sides. Presuming that omega over k, which we end up interpreting as the speed of these waves, has to be square root of whatever blob of constants appeared there in my wave equation. In this case, square root of the tension over the mass density. So that's the speed of the waves that travel on the string. If I pluck this guitar string and I make a nice sine wave, that pattern of sinusoidal ripples is going to propagate to the right along that wave at this speed. And the wavelength and the frequency Omega, as you already know, is 2 pi over the period of those waves. K, the spatial frequency, is 2 pi over the wavelength. Why am I writing the word wavelength? Because usually what symbol would we use for wavelength? Uh, lambda. Uh, lambda. 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 Lambda, which is kind of already taken as the mass density of the string. So uh, again, not enough letters in the combined Greek and Latin alphabets, apparently. <laughs> but. Um, well, you said Again, that's kind of just a quick review of what would happen if I applied Newton's laws to a point on that string. That was supposed to be something that happened near the end of 4a, but again, it kind of can easily fall through the cracks just because the end of any class is hectic. All right, so. Can we use Elvish? I thought Maxwell's equipment. Was that? Can we use Elvish for Elvish things? runes as uh, as physics variables? Yeah, I like that. I normally like to start trying to like uh, you know cannibalize the Kyrillic alphabet or something like that. But uh, yes, I, I I don't actually know any Elvish runes, but I, I I strongly approve of the idea. Okay, what about Cleon? Somebody who's a better Trekkie and a better um, Tolkien fan than me can uh, can figure out uh, <laughs> which uh, we. we, we which squiggles from Elvish or, or Klingon uh, would make good physics variables. But uh, yeah, I, I, I support the idea. In any case, we got Maxwell's equations over here. Um, in the same way that applying Newton's laws to a uh, you know, point on a curved string, you'd say, well, of course I'm going to apply Newton's laws. What else would I do with the classical mechanics problem? If I'm wondering how E fields and B fields behave in complicated situations, of course, I'll apply Maxwell's equations. What else do I do? Those are the rules of the game. Well, one thing I'm wondering here is I, I, I vaguely heard that there's such a thing as electromagnetic waves that can travel through space and that they can exist in a vacuum. In fact, I always tell my Physics 10 students, you know, that's, what, that's one of the key differences between a light wave and a sound wave is the light waves can travel in a vacuum. By vacuum, I don't just mean there's no air, but I mean, you know, over here, it's kind of looking like I need charged particles in order to create E fields and B fields. But can I have a region where there are no charged particles and the E fields and B fields can still travel through that region? Well, I don't know. Let me find out. Let me assume for the moment that I'm working in a region where there is no charge density and there is no current density. So those terms are both zero. And what does that give me? That gives me the curl of E and the curl of B both have those time-dependent terms in it. All right, how am I going to manipulate curls? Well, I have this kind of cool little identity here telling me if I take the curl of the curl of something, then I get some interesting vector calc on this side. 
I could take, say, hey, you know, let, let, let me take that out for a spin. It might be fun. It might be fun to take these out for a spin also. But um, what does this one give me? Curl of B, I already know, is my um, current density. And this is telling me the divergence of the current density is, um, is ah. Well, curl of B is my current density plus <coughs> this. Actually, this is how Maxwell proved. Let me actually take that identity for a little spin. This is how Maxwell actually realized. When I told you that Maxwell suddenly found these equations contradict each other if I don't also assume that changing E fields create a B field, let me show you why those equations contradict each other without that. That is actually an interesting thing. So suppose I were James Maxwell. I was putting these equations together. I incorporated everything that was already known about physics, except this last little fact was not something that was already known about physics. Faraday's law had been discovered. This kind of uh, mirror image of Faraday's law had not. So I could say, OK, curl of E is minus B dBt. And curl of B is mu naught j. Great. Um, if I were to take the divergence of the curl of B, let me see what I would get. Well, according to Maxwell's equations, I would get zero. Well, yeah, according to my identity over there, I would get zero. So I'll put the zero on this side. But according to Maxwell's equations, I would get mu naught times the divergence of j, current density. Now, can I have a current density that diverges outward from some point? Actually, I can if charge is leaving that point. In fact, there's something that we call the continuity equation. And this just flows from charge conservation. It says, can I ever have a divergence to my current density? Absolutely, but if I do, then the charge density at that point is decreasing as the current's flowing outward from that point. If I've got a negative divergence, that means the current's flowing inward toward that point. So the charge density will be increasing. So this is just a piece of bookkeeping that is equivalent to saying charge is conserved. So is divergence somewhat synonymous with flux through something? Um, the divergence, because we seem to use the word flow in the same kind of context when we talk about the divergence theorem divergence. tells me if I have got a region where there is a non-zero divergence, where am I finding the divergence theorem? If I have a region where there is a non-zero divergence, then yes, I will get a flux of that vector field through the boundaries of that region. So this is saying if I had a region where the charge were streaming out, where I had a positive divergence to the charge, I would expect, or to the current, I would expect to find current flowing outward through the boundary of that region. So if I... Uh, If I say, all right, you know, let me leave a little mysterious cloud of fog for that place where I might go back and modify that Maxwell equation. But if I haven't yet done that, then on one hand, I just took the divergence of the curl. Strictly, you know, by vector count, the divergence of the curl of anything is always zero. But by Maxwell's equations, the divergence of the curl is just minus mu naught d rho dt. It doesn't really make any sense because the current, I mean, the charge density can definitely be decreasing. Well, the um, if I then say, looks like I've got to put, I've got to make a change to Maxwell's equations. Maxwell mucks around. And he says, what's the simplest change I can make that lets this still work? Because d rho dt in general is not always zero. I have seen rho increase with my own eyes. I've seen rho decrease with my own eyes. This can't be true. So what have I got to put in there? Well, Maxwell found, OK, if I put in there a mu naught, epsilon naught, d, 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 what's that going to do? Well, I just took the divergence of the curl, 
which means I took the divergence of this term. Now I've got to take the divergence of this term. Divergence is a spatial derivative, so space derivatives and time derivatives, I can reverse the order of them. That's how partial derivatives work. So I can say, let me actually take DDT and let me move that spatial derivative inside that time derivative. Hey, what's the divergence of E? Um, just row over, over, over. Row over epsilon naught. So this term becomes mu naught, epsilon naught times 1 over epsilon naught rho. And I'm taking d dt of that. So this becomes d rho dt. The epsilon naughts cancel. I get mu naught d rho dt. Over here, I was getting minus root mu naught d rho dt. Maxwell's equations are saved. With that little modification to Maxwell's equations, suddenly the two sides of this thing match again. Now I've got minus rho naught d mu naught d rho dt plus mu naught d rho dt. What does that equal? That equals zero. And by my vector calc identity, the divergence of the curl was supposed to equal zero. So that's how you could say that when I was telling you that nobody had ever physically noticed that changing electric fields create magnetic fields. They had noticed it the other way around. That's Faraday's law. But they hadn't noticed that inverse version of Faraday's law. Maxwell realized mathematically it has to be true, otherwise that whole set of equations is not going to work. And that was you know, why that, that change to Maxwell's equations would rescue it and make it uh, physically non-contradictory again. Then he goes to the lab and checks, and yes, it turns out that changing electric fields really do create magnetic fields. So that's kind of a um, cool version where we managed to apply some of these vector calc identities and realize something we had not known before about the underlying physics. So, writing high on that success, Maxwell said, okay, well, if I got that by uh, just mucking around and trying to apply this identity to my equations, and I learned something very useful out of that, let me try another one. Let me try this one. So, what happens if I take the curl of the curl? Um, why don't I try it first on the E field? If I take the curl of the curl of E, well, on one hand, I've got a vector calc identity there that had been you know, very well proven by Laplace and others that says if I take the curl of the curl, what I ought to get is minus the um, Laplacian of E. And then I should get that other term that I always forget, which is plus the gradient of the divergence of E. All right. Now, this would be the gradient of the charge density, because divergence of E is you know, 1 over epsilon naught times the charge density. But Maxwell said, what if I'm doing this whole thing in a region where the charge density is 0? So if I'm in a region of vacuum, a region where rho is 0 everywhere, and also where j is zero, because I don't have any flowing charge. So if I'm in that region of vacuum, then I would say, okay, this term actually vanishes because divergence of E is supposed to be rho, but rho is zero in this region. So the, you know, this term goes away. The fact that I always say, I always forget how to construct that term anyway, it's because the next step I wanted to do, I was just gonna get rid of that term. So uh, I, that, that's why it has to be forgettable in my mind. Well, what do I get on the uh, right-hand side? So this is what the vector calc identity tells me has to happen. But if I actually plug in, what is the curl of E? The curl of E is minus dB dt. So this would be curl of minus, so I can pull up front, dB dt. What's the curl of a derivative? Well, again, curl is spatial derivatives. DDT is a time derivative, and partial derivatives I can take them in either order. D, you know, d squared f dx dy and d squared f dy dx are the same, same answer. So I can say, all right, let me move the curl inside there. This is the same thing as minus DDT of curl of B. Well, what's curl of B? If I'm in a region with zero current density, curl of B is just a couple of constants times dE dt. 
So what am I going to get here? I'm going to get minus those couple of constants, mu naught and epsilon naught. And then I've got ddt of dedt. Or in other words, I've just got that second time derivative. So what do I get? I get minus the second spatial derivative of my E field equals minus mu naught epsilon naught times the second time derivative of my E field. That starting to look familiar at all? Of course it's familiar because you, you, you have at the front of your mind that uh, Newton's law problem that clearly everybody had time to do at the end of 4a. If the second time derivative and the second spatial derivative are the same thing, that, that's the wave equation. Now, we know I was doing just um, one spatial derivative here, just d squared dx squared. The Laplacian is saying, OK, let's actually do all three. Take d squared dx squared plus d squared dy squared plus d squared dz squared. If I wanted, I could take a case where the fields were only varying in the x direction. I could say that that means those two are 0. Yeah? That'll be this one, so I'll show you that in a moment. Yeah. Right. So what did I just get mathematically? I got the wave equation. Um, this thing that I showed you, which was the wave equation with one spatial dimension, generalizes very nicely to the del squared version, which is the wave equation in three spatial dimensions. But other than that, that is the wave equation. And if I say that my fields are only changing in the x direction, just arbitrarily, then I can say, okay, that means those two derivatives zero out, and I've got back the exact wave equation that we're used to seeing on a string or something like that. So this is saying these electromagnetic fields in a region of a vacuum can nonetheless travel through that region of a vacuum as waves. By the way, what do these two constants tell you? You know, I can exactly. The, um, the version I had there is saying the second time derivative equals the wave speed squared times the second spatial derivative. So if I want to write this this way, I'll say, OK, here's the second time derivative of E. And it should equal 1 over mu naught epsilon naught times the second spatial derivative of E. And I'll still write out the full del squared version of that. What's this? This is the speed squared. The speed's the square root of that. So the speed of these waves is 1 over the square root of mu naught epsilon naught. Well, Maxwell was probably pretty intrigued. He said, hey, according to this, I could actually make a wave out of electric and magnetic fields. I wonder if I could, just like when he realized that uh, changing E fields had to create B fields, he said, could I go to lab and could I verify that? He now says, hey, could I go to lab and could I actually make a wave out of electric and magnetic fields? I bet nobody's ever seen anything like that before. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess the first thing that I've got to check, yeah, ha, ha. The, the, the first thing that I've got to check is how fast will that wave move? Well, he knew the value for mu naught, 4 pi times to the minus 7. He knew the value for epsilon naught, 1 over 4 pi times k coulomb is the way I think of it. Plugs in those two values, takes the square root, puts it under a rising thing, scribbles it all out of the back of an envelope. That's how I imagine it. And he must have fallen out of his chair because that was a very familiar number. The speed of light by this time was well known and well measured experimentally. What, what, what? What he just realized was, uh, yeah, ha ha, has anybody ever seen anything like this before? Well, yeah, this is the only thing anybody has ever seen, which is light waves. So this is when, um, when uh, humans first realized that, uh, yeah, light waves are actually, now we know what they are. We know that they're a wave made out of electric and magnetic fields. And, um, so there are a couple oscillators. What's that? There are a couple oscillators. Uh, yes, you could think of every different like uh, normal mode, every every uh, frequency that you could uh, imagine constructing in this room as kind of a, a whole bunch of different coupled oscillators. Yeah. Now, what does that actually look like if I were to draw out graphically the solution? I mean, I know what the solution to this one looks like graphically. It ends up giving me this nice little wiggly wave on a guitar string that's going to propagate off to the right. What does that one look like? Well, it would be saying that the E field, essentially if I pl plot the E field at various points in space, 
I should get that same kind of behavior that the guitar string was giving me. I should get, get an E field that varies sinusoidally like this. Now, if I go back and I do the same thing, if I take the curl of the curl of B instead of the curl of the curl of E, I get exactly the same result. If I take the curl of the curl of B, well, right here, hey, no magnetic monopoles, so divergence of B goes away immediately, and all I've got left is that negative del squared. On the right-hand side, if I was taking the curl of the curl of B, I'll get the curl of J, but if I'm in vacuum, then we set the current density was zero, I will get the curl of D, E, D, T, which is D, D, T of the curl of E, which is D, D, T of D, 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 T, which is D squared B, D, T squared. I get the same equation again for magnetic fields as well as for um, electric fields. And it also turns out that I'm going to show this one right away. It turns out I'm going to ask you to take this on faith for now that, yes, the magnetic fields also vary sinusoidally with position, but they've got to be perpendicular to the E field. Why did I pause and say, should I take that on faith? Well, because it would take, uh, you know, a few lines of algebra, and I, I, I don't want to, um, to I, I don't want to focus on saying, hey, can we do a few more algebraic identities over there? It's way past time I started drawing you physical pictures of this light wave. So this is the solution you get. Your E field varies sinusoidally like that. <coughs> Your B field varies sinusoidally, but it's got to be on a 90 degree angle to the oh. E field as it turns uh, out. Okay. So your B field is pointing out of the page all through this region and pointing into the page all through this region. And in fact, they vary in phase with each other. The point where the E field's the strongest is also where the B field's the strongest. You can get all of those things by just fiddling around some more algebraically over there. But I don't want to do more algebraic fiddling around, at least not until I've said physically, let's take a look at this wave, see what's happening. Now this entire pattern of electric and magnetic fields is going to be propagating through space in that direction at speed c. How do I know it's propagating through space? Because again, that's what the solution to the wave equation is. The, uh, you know, the form for the wave equation, the differential equation, is this. The ansatz that you can plug in and figure out that it, it works, that it solves the wave equation, is this one. It gives you this sine or cosine wave that propagates sideways through space. So that's what this light wave is going to be doing. It's going to be propagating through space at that familiar speed, c. Now, does this kind of make sense physically? Yeah, if I were to now say, hey, well, I'm right at this region here, can I take a look at Maxwell's equations? At this point right here, remember the E fields are pointing up on this side, they're pointing up more weakly on this side. Would you say there's a curl to the E field at that point? Is the E field circulating through space at that point? Yeah. If you want to look at a vector field and figure out whether it has a curl, for example, we talked before about like shears. Does this vector field have a curl in the region that I drew? Which yes. way is it yeah. curling? Clockwise or counterclockwise? Clockwise. Clockwise, which means the curl points into the page. What's one way I can tell that? Um, something that the math teachers often tell you is imagine you were constructing a little vector sensitive windmill at that point. Um, you know, I can imagine that instead of uh, some abstract thing like a B field, this was supposed to just represent a fluid velocity or something like that. If I built a little windmill that could uh, rotate around whatever axis I want, would that windmill be spinning right now? Yes. Hell uh, so yeah, it would be spinning clockwise. Let me come over here. Would this windmill be spinning? Yes. Yes. No. Because it's got a greater E field wind pushing on this side, torquing it clockwise, a smaller E field wind pushing on this side, trying to torque it counterclockwise. Yeah. Yes, that is a curl. That is a clockwise curl. Might be easier if I'd asked you, is the windmill spinning at this point? Nine. And you'd say, yeah, Nine. definitely. Yeah. Because, now, yeah, no, 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 no. It, it is, yes, yeah. because as you move to the right, you get that downward E field. As you move to the left, you got the upward E field. This is a point of zero wind, if I was imagining E field winds, but it's a point where, again, the wind is circulating clockwise around that point. 
Um, at that point, though, could we also say that it's like a changing kind of flux to the service? Um, changing magnetic flux. Well, well um, magnetic flux through which surface? Through that little rectangle you drew, the blue. Ah. Um, you said one size increasing, it's decreasing through it. It's into the page. Thing is, the total flux through that, if this, that blue thing, if that were a three dimensional enclosed box. Not a box, but like a loop. Oh, yes. Yes, I can say I've got DDT of a, um, of a flux through that, which means that the curl of V would be um, circulating. If I've got DDT of that, mag of that magnetic flux, then the curl of E should be non-zero. And yes, that's, a, so, oh yeah, you're, you're a step ahead of me there, oh, yes. Because okay. I was, gonna, okay, I, I was gonna think of it a little bit differently. I was gonna think of the DDT of B being the fact that it's sweeping to the right through there. But yes, if I were to look at this point right here and say, it looks to me like the curl of E is clockwise. Or in other words, the curl of E, what does clockwise mean? Clockwise means the curl of E is into the page. So at this point, it looks to me like the curl of E is into the page. Over here, curl of E should depend on dBdt, should be opposite dBdt. Is the magnetic field at this point changing? Yes. yes, because this entire pattern, if I were able to hit play on this, the entire pattern would be doing what? Sweeping to the right. These stronger B fields over here are about to make their way past this point. The B field at this point is increasing because if I stand still at this point, as the wave passes, this stronger and stronger B field region is gonna reach me. For that matter, at this point, the B field is increasing out of the page because a moment in the past, this region of the wave passed that point. The B field was into the page. Right now, the B field at this point is zero. A minute in the future, this region of the wave will reach there. The B field will be out of the page. So you do have to think not just of the you know, uh, spatial derivatives here, but you have to think how are those fields changing with time at each point. And the wave equation answers you that by saying, oh yeah, the ensembles we used didn't work. Maybe the two sides of the wave equation match is that this whole pattern is sweeping to the right. So the time derivatives, you kind of say, if I want to know what's going to happen next at this point, I just look a little bit to the left, because whatever's to the left of me is about to pass me. So here I say, if I look a little bit to the left, I see stronger B fields out of the page. Those are about to get to me. So the B field here is increasing out of the page. In other words, dBdt right here is out of the page. The curl of E right here is into the page. And this Maxwell's equation says the curl of E and dBdt, those ought to be vectors pointing in opposite directions. Oh, yeah. shit, they are. Yes. Is the x-axis in this drawing a uh, time, or is it? No, the x-axis is actual position. I'm taking a snapshot of those E and B fields at one moment in time. Okay. Then if I want to imagine how, how time goes on, I say, okay, this whole physical snapshot I took is going to be sweeping to the right at speed C. The okay. reason why I couldn't just kind of say, why don't I just make this axis time in the first place, is I needed to be able to look at the spatial layout to see things like the curl. Mm -hmm. The reason I can see that the curl of E is um, into the page at this point is because I'm actually looking at E at, at different points. I'm, you know, curl is a spatial derivative. And then I'd say, how do I do the time derivatives? I imagine this whole pattern moving continually to the right like this. Mm -hmm. And when I do that, yes, the curl of E is minus D, 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 that works. How about the curl of B? If I were to place a magnetic field sensitive windmill at this point, would that windmill be spinning around any axis? Which axis? It's spinning around a vertical axis. It looks like curl of B points downward. Because I'm saying, oh yeah, the B field's like, you know, if this is a B field sensitive windmill, then this flange of the windmill is being pushed out of the page. This flange is being pushed into the page, but not quite as strongly. So this direction of rotation wins, and the curl of B at this point does point downward. How about DEDT? Well, DEDT um, is, I would look here and I would say, is the E field, oh wait, shit. 
The B tail's into the page, not out of the page. Yeah, the curl of B doesn't point downward. Curl, curl of I mean, B points upward. I was forgetting what my uh, dots and crosses mean there. Curl of B points upward because, again, I, if my fingers are a B field sensitive windmill, the B field's pushing on this side of the axis more strongly, push on this side less strongly. So the windmill will spin that way. And that direction of spin is an upward curl of B. So curl of B is pointing upward. How about D, E, B, T? Well, the E field here is pointing downward, but how's it changing with time? As always, if my wave is sweeping past toward the right, if I want to know what's going to happen a little bit in the future, I look to the left, because this is the part of the wave that's about to reach me. What's the E field look like over here? It looks weaker than it is at this point. So E is downward, but D, E, D, T is upward. Because that, e, that downward E field is growing weaker. I'm moving into the weaker E field part of that wave. So, but it's moving to the stronger, right. It's increasing you know? to the right. Of the yes. So here's my downward E field. Mm -hmm. Here's you know. So at this moment, I've got a downward E field that points like this. But what will I have a little bit in the future? I'll have this downward E field. I'll have this weaker downward E field. Uh, if a vector is getting weaker with time, which way does its time derivative point? Opposite. You first learned that when you were thinking about acceleration and velocity. If the velocity is slowing down, which way does the acceleration point? Yeah. Opposite of velocity. So yes, E at this point is pointing downward. D, E, D, T, because we're about to replace this vector with this one, and then this one, and then this one. What's the time rate of change? It's upward. So curl of B is upward. D, E, D, T is upward. Does that work? Yes. Over here, I had a plus sign on this term. So the curl of B, in a region where there is no current density, because we're in a vacuum, is supposed to be positive. It's supposed to be in the same direction as D, E, D, T, which in this case it is. So yeah, that pattern of electric and magnetic fields does turn out to be exactly what you need to satisfy Maxwell's equations. And as it turns out, all along, now by this time the science of optics was pretty well developed, but nobody actually had known what a light wave was. In fact, they didn't know that they didn't know. They just thought a light wave is an independent phenomenon. It's a light wave. It doesn't follow the same rules as uh, Newton's laws. It doesn't follow the same rules as Maxwell's equations. It's a whole different branch of physics. At this moment, they realized, hey, not only did we just take everything that's been learned in a century of intense research on electric and magnetic fields and sum it up in one set of equations that you could write on the front of a t-shirt if you wanted to, but also as a special bonus prize, if you act now, we will also throw in a complete understanding of optics. Everything that had never been learned about optics, Snell's law, the interference of light waves, Fresnel interference, uh, Fraunhofer interference, diffraction, the um, percentage, you know, if you've got light passing through a transparent medium, Part of the energy bounces off that surface, part of it continues on through. They had worked out empirical equations for what fraction bounces off and what fraction continues through. All of those properties of light could be understood straight from Maxwell's equations. Not only did it properly describe the speed of light, but if you then kind of say, well, if I was, in, if instead of a vacuum, I'm in a polarizable medium like glass, I would start to put in everything I know about electric polarization, and I find I could describe the way light waves behave in glass, in water. Everything that was known about light waves was a perfect match between the predictions from Maxwell's equations and, um, and the existing science of optics. You could say humanity could have just totally ignored optics for all those years, and then at the last minute kind of given themselves a crash course on optics just straight from Maxwell's equations, and we, uh, we would have learned just as much. If, I mean, I, I've mentioned before, this was kind of the moment in history when physicists maybe reached peak arrogance. We're, we're uh, even more arrogant at this point than we are today. And you had people like Lord Kelvin walking around feeling qualified to tell every other scientist on the planet how to do their jobs. Well, it was kind of, the, there was a reason why we were feeling this sense of triumph. It's just bad. Everything is falling together. If Lord Kelvin said, man, I think it's like uh, two or three years before we understand the entire universe, and then physics will be done. 
Well, it was kind of the, the, the yeah. era in history where you might almost imagine making a statement like that and, um, and, and being taken seriously. The, um, now, I want to show you one other thing before we wrap up here and move over to the lab for, like I said, what we'll probably do today is just going to be a, a review during, uh, during lab. But the um, thing I want to show you is something called the Poincaré vector. Um, actually, the name of the gentleman who discovered it is actually just pronounced pointing. I uh, like to evaluate the, um, the I, I like to pronounce the uh, name a little bit more uh, enunciated because it wasn't me, of course, but there are people on the earth who have gone many years just thinking that was called the pointing vector, like pointing with your finger or something like that. Of course, I would never be that foolish. Um, <laughs> that school when I realized how to spell pointing vector. The, um, so what is the pointing vector? Now, its definition, known as S, it is equal to some confidence. I think it's mu naught over epsilon naught, if I remember right. No, it's the other way around, epsilon naught over mu naught. Doesn't really matter. It's equal to some fundamental constants times the cross product of the E field and the B field. Now, you can apply this not just to light waves. You can apply this any time you've got an E field and a B field. But you notice, in the case of this light wave, if I have the E field and the B field, if I were to take the cross product of those two vectors, E cross B, what would I get? Well, if I apply the right hand rule, I get a vector that's pointing to the right, a vector that happens to be pointing in the direction of the, uh, the, the velocity of this light wave. Well, it turns out any time you've got an E field and a B field, and any time their cross product is not <coughs> zero, what the pointing vector tells you is two things. It tells you the energy flux. It tells you how rapidly this pattern of E fields and B fields are carrying energy through space. If I get zero for the pointing vector, that means there might be some energy stored in that pattern, but the energy isn't moving. It isn't actually going anywhere. For example, if I give you a static pattern of E fields and no B field, then you'd say, yeah, the E fields are storing energy. The E fields in a capacitor are very good at storing energy, for example. But that energy is not going anywhere. It's staying where it is. If you've got an E field and a B field, and if their cross product is non-zero, that means the energy is actually being transported through space. So in this case, you can say, oh yeah, I can see right here, cross product of E and B is non-zero. This electromagnetic wave is transporting energy through space. I kind of suspected that, because now that I know this is what light waves are, I know I can just put my hand outside in the sun and I can feel you know, the, the energy from those light waves um, turning into thermal energy as it hits my hand. So I know that light waves do transport energy, but this, in fact, set of energy flux, since that word flux can mean so many different things in different contexts, I'm just going to say this is energy transport. The pointing vector also gives you one extra useful thing, though. You actually have to kind of recalibrate those constants. You put an extra factor of C in there or something like that. But um, it is also proportional to the momentum density. This means light waves do not just transport um, energy, but they contain momentum. In other words, when I put my hand out in that sunlight, Yes, I feel the thermal energy warming up my hand. I also feel, and this is more subtle, but I feel a push from those light waves. Why is it more subtle? Because it turns out that it's one over the speed of light times the pointing vector that gives you the momentum density. So the momentum density is much smaller since by in everyday units, the speed of light's a big number. So the momentum in those light waves is kind of subtle and not as easy to detect. But those light waves do carry momentum. They can push on things. Now. But they have no mass, right? They have no mass. Right. You know when we say momentum is mv? Yeah. That is true in Newtonian physics. We also say things like kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. That is also true in Newtonian physics. That is, neither of those things are true in special relativity. Uh, it turns out this is a low energy formula for the kinetic energy. What's the real formula for kinetic energy? Well, it's, it's um, 
E equals MC squared, Einstein's famous thing, A. over the square root of 1 minus B squared over C squared. That is actually a fully relativistic formula for, uh, for energy. By the way, if I, if I say, yeah, but you know, sometimes V is a tiny fraction of C. What can I do if I've got like one plus a tiny correction? Oh shit, we've done a lot of that this semester. What can I do if I have one plus a tiny correction? Power series, yeah. So I can say, this is saying energy is mc squared times one minus b squared over c squared to the negative one half. It's all coming together. Yes, there's the fully relativistic version of the um, formula for the energy of any, um, any particle, whether it's moving or stationary or what. But you could say, if B over C is a small number, if it's much less than 1, I could do a power series here. I mean, I could do the power series anyway, but if, if that's a small number, the power series will be useful because the, the higher order terms will, go, will be uh, shrinking rapidly. So I could say, what's the power series of this guy? Hey, I, I'm just going to do a binomial theorem. I start my expansion with 1. What's my next term? If I have 1 plus u to the nth power, my first term is always 1. My next correction is the power times u. So in this case, it would be negative 1 half times u, which is negative v squared over c squared, plus dot, dot, dot. There's more terms that I'm leaving off of that expansion. But if I stop after that one, what do I get? My first term is just energy equals mc squared. That's the famous rest energy of a particle. That's saying that's energy that mass has just by existing. But what's my next term? Yeah. mc squared times the negatives cancel, the c squareds cancel. Oh. <laughs> oh, God. There's where that Newtonian kinetic, kinetic energy, energy came from. But it is just the first term in a larger expansion. If the thing's going at a decent fraction of the speed of light, I have to start realizing that's no longer true. Um, one thing this means is, and by the way, the full formula for momentum also has a similar modification. It also has that square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared in it. What does this mean for a particle that is going at the speed of light? Well, if a particle is going at the speed of light, it looks to me like both the momentum and the energy have to be infinite. Because if you're going oh, at the speed of c, to zero. Yeah, you're dividing by zero. The denominator becomes zero. Now you can say, well, in, in that, this is why I cannot take this coffee cup and ever get it to reach the speed of light. Or I can't even take a single electron and get it to reach the speed of light. Because even a single electron has at least a little bit of mass. If I try to get it going literally the speed of light, not point nine, 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 nine c, but c, then that electron would have infinite energy. Um, the uh, it would also have infinite momentum. That can't happen to an electron. This is why even in the biggest particle accelerators, you know, in the world, you never actually get an electron to the speed of light. You just get it closer and closer. However, there's one loophole, which is what. Um, I could have a particle moving the speed of light without giving it infinite energy or infinite momentum if the particle had zero mass. Zero mass, zero zero mass, mass. which is exactly what a photon has. Yeah, that would be zero over zero. Zero over zero, which is indeterminate, exactly. If the zeros both came from the same place, I might be able to apply L'Hopital's rule. But I'd say in this case, one zero comes from the fact I've got zero mass. The other zero comes from the fact that I'm moving at the speed of light, which makes that square root thing zero. They come from different sources, so I can't even L'Hopital rule them. If you, ask quantum, if you ask relativity, what should be the energy of a photon? Or what should be the momentum of a photon? Relativity shrugs and says, I don't know. It could be anything. Well, this is true. Energy of a photon could be anything. The energy of a photon actually depends on its what? Frequency. 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 Quantum mechanics uh, is the one that steps in and says, OK, if relativity doesn't know what the energy of that photon is, <laughs> I guess I got to take over here. I'll tell you the energy of that photon. So the fact that the energy of a photon is h bar omega, relativity doesn't disagree with that statement, but relativity also doesn't agree with that statement. It just says, nah, the energy of a photon could be anything. But the, um, the you know, quantum mechanics says, OK, I got a specific answer for you there. So this light wave, now for now, I'm just thinking of this as a wave of electric and magnetic fields. I'm not thinking of it as, particles, massless or not. 
But this light wave also, as it turns out, does carry both energy, and the pointing vector tells you how much energy it transports, and it also carries momentum. Now, speaking of electromagnetic fields carrying momentum, I got 120 seconds left to blow your mind. <laughs> you can't blow it any further than this, though. Well, this, this blew mine when I uh, finally realized it. You know how we always tell you Newton's third law? If I push on this coffee cup with a force F, the coffee cup must be doing what to me? Resisting. Yeah. Pushing yeah. back with an equal strength force in the opposite direction. Newton's third law is built into uh, classical mechanics, we say, because why is Newton's third law important? It seems like I don't use it as often as I use the second. I use the second to set up these differential equations. When do we ever use the third law in practice? Oh, course. Every, course. Time every time we invoke um, momentum conservation. Newton's third law is the whole reason why momentum conservation works. Is if I, you know, the force you apply to something tells you how much momentum you're giving it per unit time. The fact that it's giving you the same momentum per unit time in the opposite direction, this is why momentum conservation works. Now, let me show you something. Here's a positively charged particle moving this way. Here's a second positively charged particle moving this way. <coughs> Quickly. I know that they're exerting an electric force on each other and that those forces really are equal and opposite. Um, because, you know, the particles are repelling each other and all that kind of thing. Are they also exerting a magnetic force on each other? Uh, yes. 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 Sure. Yes. Yeah, this guy's a moving charged particle, so it produces B fields. It produces B fields that wrap around this axis. So up here, tell me about the B fields produced by this guy. Um, they're, they're running around. Coming out. Yeah. They'll be pointing yeah. out of the page. Out. So this is the B fields. And my guy is going to... Force. Yeah, so, so this is B fields produced by this guy. So I'm going to call this particle number one, this particle number two. This is the B fields produced by number one. Do they exert a force on number two? Absolutely. Fields coming out of the page, um, particles moving downward, it is positively charged, it feels a force pushing it to the left. Okay, awesome. That must mean that the uh, other one feels a force pushing it to the right, because I totally believe Newton's third law. Um, no. Let's find out. Nine. This guy produces B fields over here, pointing into the page. So this is B fields produced by number two. Produced by number two. Back. The particle's moving to the right. It is experiencing B fields that are pointing into the page. The force on it is upward. Wait a minute. Those two forces do not oppose one another. Newton's third law was lying to me in plain sight all along when it said those two forces had to be equal. And at first I might say, okay, that's okay. I never really use Newton's third law. I use the second law all the time. Yes, I do use the third law. That's where momentum conservation comes from. For a moment, it looks like, man, all of physics is just broken. Until I remember one more thing. Okay, I've got this pattern of B fields. Near this guy, actually the most important B fields are the ones produced by particle number one. So the B fields will be pointing out of the page up here, into the page down there. Near this guy, the most important B fields are the ones produced by number, by number two. They will be pointing <laughs> into the page and out of the page. The E fields, meanwhile, are pointing like this in this region and like this in that region. And they're going to zero if I get close to the boundary, so the field lines are kind of doing that kind of thing. Is there momentum stored in this region? Sure. E fields pointing that way, B fields pointing this way. The momentum, the pointing vector, is pointing down like that. You can see why I misunderstood the, uh, the, the spelling of pointing vector. The pointing vector points this way. Up here, B fields into the page, E fields down like that. The pointing vector points this way. There. And as those particles get closer, what do you think happens to those pointing vectors? They get, fun. They they get stronger. So I've got momentum that's pointing down and to the right. 
but the momentum stored in those fields is getting stronger with time. What's happened to the mechanical momentum of those particles? It's changing in a direction that's DD, that those forces tell me DDT of the mechanical momentum. The mecha mechanical momentum is becoming more and more upward and left with time. The momentum of the electromagnetic fields is becoming more and more downward and right. Yes, just... momentum is still conserved, but you've got to take into account the momentum that's being stored in those electromagnetic fields. So it turns out, you know, if you think of Newton's third law as just saying, the force you put on the coffee cup will always be equal and opposite to the force the coffee cup puts on you, Newton's third law actually is broken when it comes to electromagnetism. However, if you think of Newton's third law in a slightly more general sense, if you think, no, Newton's third law just states that momentum is conserved, it turns out that yes, momentum is still conserved, but you've got to consider the momentum stored in the fields as well as the momentum stored in the physical objects. <laughs> That's an awesome way to have the class right there. Okay, what I was saying at the beginning is um, the I, I am actually not not functioning at my uh, at my best today. I've got the uh, migraines have been bothering me the, all the last few days. Instead of trying to have a uh, chaotic lab where there's a thousand conversations going on, because I think uh, my brain would uh, refuse to cooperate in that case, um, why don't we instead spend the next few hours on a uh, on a review session? You want to hold it here? You want to hold it in the lab? Which one's more comfortable? Here. 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 Okay. Let me take a break because I have been kind of talking uh, faster and faster as we get up to here, so I could yeah. use a little bit of rest. But um, why don't we break? But the time we would normally spend on lab. Uh, we'll we'll spend out on a review session in here. Yes.